nature is everywhere. I often find her in the smallest places, along busy roads, cracks in sidewalks, or hanging onto buildings. Nature is squeezing through and is always ready when we need her. She's a great teacher. One of my favorite ways to engage nature is walking. Walking gives me time to reflect and escape the madness of our high-tech world. The rapid growth of science and technology during the 18th century fueled the growth of civilization, giving people the false impression that they could conquer nature and outsmart her wisdom. As a reaction to this approach, philosophers, poets, and artists during this time period had renewed interest in nature. For example, Lord Byron published a lengthy narrative poem that used nature as a distraction from the wars that were plaguing Europe during this time period. His words resonate as if they were written today. There is a pleasure in the pathless woods. There is a rapture on the lonely shore. There is society where none intrudes by the deep sea and music in its roar. I love not man the less, but nature more, from these our interviews, in which I steal from all I may be, or have been before, to mingle with the universe, and feel what I can ne'er express, yet cannot all conceal. American writers such as Emerson and Thoreau expanded on these thoughts. Thoreau even wrote an essay that championed the simple act of taking a stroll through nature. I think that I cannot preserve my health and spirits unless I spend four hours a day at least, and it is commonly more than that, sauntering through the woods and over the hills and fields, absolutely free from all worldly engagements. But the walking of which I speak has nothing in it akin to taking exercise, as it is called, as the sick take medicine at stated hours, as the swinging of dumbbells or chairs, but is itself the enterprise and adventure of the day. If you would get exercise, go in search of the springs of life. Think of a man swinging dumbbells for his health when those springs are bubbling up in far-off pastures unsought by him. Moreover, you must walk like a camel, which is said to be the only beast which ruminates when walking. When a traveler asked Wordsworth's servant to show him her master's study, she answered, Here is his library, but his study is out of doors. Of course, it is of no use to direct our steps to the woods if they do not carry us thither. I am alarmed when it happens that I have walked a mile into the woods bodily without getting there in spirit. In my afternoon walk, I would fain forget all my morning occupations and my obligations to society. But it sometimes happens that I cannot easily shake off the village. The thought of some work will run in my head, and I am not where my body is. I am out of my senses. In my walks, I would fain return to my senses. What business have I in the woods, if I am thinking of something out of the woods? I suspect myself, and cannot help a shudder, when I find myself so implicated even in what are called good works, for this may sometimes happen. Thoreau was interested in wild nature, not nature that had been tamed with man's improvements. The wilderness should be available to everyone and to the public. His predictions were interesting about the evil days that may come. You know, times were changing in the 1800s, and uh, there might be a time in the future when the walker would have less freedom. At present, in this vicinity, the best part of the land is not private property. The landscape is not owned, and the walker enjoys comparative freedom. But possibly the day will come when it will be partitioned off into so-called pleasure grounds in which a few will take a narrow and exclusive pleasure only, when fences shall be multiplied 
and man-traps and other engines invented to confine men to the public road, and walking over the surface of God's earth shall be construed to mean trespassing on some gentleman's grounds. To enjoy a thing exclusively is commonly to exclude yourself from the true enjoyment of it. Let us improve our opportunities, then, before the evil days come. Later in his essay, Thoreau talks about his preferred direction to walk. And of course, he preferred going west, where in North America there was less civilization and more grand open space. <laughs> Give me the ocean, the desert, or the wilderness. In the desert, pure air and solitude compensate for want of moisture and fertility. The traveler Burton says of it, Your morale improves. You become frank and cordial, hospitable and single-minded. In the desert, spiritous liquors excite only disgust. There is a keen enjoyment in a mere animal existence. Rest assured, however, nature is always present, even in large cities. Her untamed wildlife move freely through the crevices of civilization. We often relax by listening to birds singing. We see them flying from place to place. Lest we not forget her lessons, nature occasionally reminds us of her awesome power with earthquakes, floods, and fire. Remember to follow nature's lead. Until next time, peace. Looks like fun. I'm hungry. What, what's okay, we have a beef and cheese. Seeing that we didn't taste like this. Goldfish. Fiber one bar. Well, I'll have the fiber one bar. Oh, you want it, Matthew? Oh, we've got two of them. We've got two of them. Want the okay. one? Yeah, I'll take that one. So Thank you. Oh, uh, it looks like we've got some apples. Oh, that that's there? good. No. Oh, That'd be fun last time. time. Yeah. We've got apples and more goldfish. Oh, fun. It's a tree, whatever it is. Mm.